before I uh, get started, you know, I'm always reflecting after Bible study. And I'm thinking to myself, Lord, did I go too fast? Did I talk? Did I give them too much information? Because I know when I get excited and get to talking, I start saying a whole lot of stuff. So I always want to um, give you all an opportunity to ask any questions about anything that's not clear. Uh, or, or if not, you know, I can move on and hopefully I'll clarify it in the lesson because you know I'm going to repeat and go over uh, what I've gone over the week before. But just to be sure, because I don't want this just to be a banking method of pedagogy where I just do all of the instruction uh, and talking, I want to make sure that you have, I give you ample time to ask questions and process and reflect. So before we get started, we're going to pick up talking about uh, offense. We had a good discussion about offense last week. How many of you all were blessed by the Bible study uh, last week? Did that, did that discussion about offense help you last week? Um, I know I enjoyed putting it together and I certainly enjoyed talking about it last week. So tonight we're going to, well, let me stop. Any questions, comments before we move on? Any questions? comments. I don't have a question, but it did tickle me because I kept getting put to the test last week. <laughs> and I had to <laughs> say, I'm not going to get offended. <laughs> you not going to offend me. <laughs> it was one test after another. So thank you. <laughs> Praise God. So you, you were really trying to apply that word to your life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what Jesus said? It's impossible almost not to be offended. It's a matter of how we decide we're going to, um, respond to to uh the spirit of offense anybody else thank you tracy for sharing that are you all still sharing something one thing that you learned you know i talked about exponential potential that as we learn and as we grow i'm inviting you to share at least one thing that you've learned with somebody else are you doing that every week taking taking one nugget that really resonates with you and sharing that with somebody so that we can really expand in terms of how we grow and mature as a uh, people of God. I see you saying, yes, somebody say every day, pastor Marilyn say every day, <laughs> praise God. Thank you for doing that because you know, we don't want to just hold all this information and inspiration and illumination that we are receiving to ourselves. The other thing is, as you share with other people, it's just like teaching. If you teach, you learn. If you've ever taught a class or anything like that, you know that if you're in your preparation, you learn as much as the student does, probably sometimes more because of the necessity of preparation. So let's get started. Okay, Deacon Sean, you can put the um, slides up, slide up on the screen. Last week, we started our discussion uh, talking about the trap of offense. The trap of offense. And, you know, sometimes it's spelled O F F E N S E, or sometimes it's spelled O F F E N C E. And offense has been referred to as a trap or bait, B A I T. Um, it means uh, because it is often viewed as a trap because it can lead or ensnare individuals. I think you can go to the next slide, Sean. I think there's another slide behind it. Okay, that's okay. You can leave it right there. It's been called a fence. It's been called a bait or a trap because it can lead um, individuals or ensnare individuals into negative, unproductive patterns or behavior or interpersonal dynamics. I'll say that again. Offense, the Greek word is scandalon, which properly means uh, that at which one stumbles or takes offense. It's been referred to in its original meaning as bait or a trap because it can lead to or ensnare individuals in negative, unproductive, and I would also add unhealthy patterns of behavior and interpersonal dynamics. In other words, what I'm saying is that when we get offended, if we get offended, whether it's justifiable or not, because some there are some offenses that that 
that are justifiable offenses is what I mean. People deliberately set out to harm and injure us. But whether they're justifiable or whether they're something that we got offended because we were looking at it through a lens of rejection or we decided to take something too personal, at the end of the day, offense has the potential to trap us. It has the potential to trap us in a cycle of negative, unproductive, and unhealthy behavior as well as interpersonal dynamics. So offense affects us, but it also can affect our relationships. I'll say that again. Offense can affect us, but it will also affect our relationships. Is that, is that somebody on, on the screen, Shauna? You see that? It was an accident, I think. Huh? It was an accident. Somebody accidentally oh, okay. did that. Okay, I just want to make sure we didn't have a... Um, what do you call it? Uh, a hacker in the middle of Bible study. So the Greek word again for if offense is, which properly means one that stumbles or takes offense. And when we talk about the definition of offense, it can actually mean a couple of things. One, it can mean an injury or a transgression or a wrong that is done to someone. It can be an injury, a transgression, or a wrong that is done to someone, or it has been described as a stumbling block or a cause of temptation. It has been described as a stumbling block or a cause of temptation. Some commentators, as I mentioned earlier, say that the word originally referred to the part of a trap where the bait was attached. That's why they call it a trap. That's why it's referred to sometimes as a trap. Some commentators say that the original word scandalon, the Greek word, which translates into offense. When you look up, when you look at the word offense in the English, in the Bible, normally when you look at any word just about, let me just back up and say, when you look at just about any word in the Bible, normally there is a Greek or a Hebrew word that is translated, that gives you a deeper meaning. If it's in the New Testament, it will usually be a Greek word. If it's in the Old Testament, it will usually be a Hebrew word. And sometimes when you hear me saying, uh, a lot of times when I'm preaching, I'll say that word translates to mean, or that word in the Greek means, or that word in the Hebrew means. I'm not trying to um, put off or display any kind of erudition, what I'm really trying to do is help you understand the deeper meaning that sometimes gets lost in translation. So scandalon, if you were to look at the word offense in most places, now that's not always the case. It's not always universally true, but in the context in which we are speaking, offense, the Greek word for offense is scandalon, which usually means an injury, transgression, or wrong that is done to someone or a stumbling block or a cause of temptation. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So when we say, when we talk about offense, we talk about the um, act of laying a trap in someone's way. The act of laying a trap in someone's way, whether someone offends us, it can potentially be a trap, or if we become offended, by something someone says to us or someone does to us, it can become a trap. The New Testament often describes um, offense as entrapment that is used by the enemy. In other words, what the uh, New Testament writers tend to think about offense or what they usually try to communicate to us about offense is that it is a tool, somebody type in the chat. Offense is a tool. Offense, O-F-F-E-N-S-E -F -F -E or C-E is a tool that the devil uses to bring people into captivity. And I can say here myself, having known what it's like to be offended, knowing that if we do not um, choose to, to, to choose to live offense free, that it can pull us into it can pull us into captivity. 
It can pull us into a prison of resentment and bitterness and hostility because that's how the enemy works. As I said last week, I don't necessarily see offense as a strategy. I see it as a tool. And even if it's a tool that the enemy, the devil, as we refer to the devil in scripture, who represents the personification of all that is evil in the world and in our lives and everything, that the personification of that which tries to get us to abandon our divine vocation and walk away from God, it is a tool that the enemy uses to bring us into captivity, to bring us into a prison of offense. Check out what Paul said to Timothy. Timothy was his son in the ministry. You can go to the next slide, Sean. Timothy was his son in the ministry who was beginning taking over a church at Ephesus. And when Paul was talking to him or mentoring him, this is one of the things that he said to him in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse uh, 22 through 24. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone. Somebody type everyone. A servant of the Lord must not be, be must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone. Now that, that's a whole lesson right there in and of itself, because what that means is, is that if you're going to be in leadership, you got to be kind to everybody, whether you want to be or not, whether they are kind to you or not, you have to be kind or try as much as lies within you to be kind and not quarrel with everyone. Notice what else he says. They must be able to teach. And here's the real challenge. Be patient with difficult people. Lord have mercy. Somebody type in the chat, Lord have mercy. A servant of the Lord must be patient with difficult people. And we already know that difficult people test us, all of us, myself included. That's why I said type, Lord have mercy. And we're not just talking about this really on in, in worship or in the context of ministry. We are a servant of the Lord. Now, he was talking to Timothy as a pastor. But if we are leaders, if we're going to represent Jesus, wherever we are, we want to try to be kind to everybody. Remember last year we talked about representing Jesus. And I said, if we don't do anything else right, we're going to be kind and what? We're going to be Christian. So here's what Paul is saying to Timothy. He says, a servant of the Lord must be kind to everyone, must not quarrel, must be apt to teach, have the ability to teach, and be patient with difficult people. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps, notice what, what Paul says about folks who are oppositional. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God, will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap for they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. So what is Paul saying? That difficult people test our limits. Somebody type, they test us, they test us. I heard Dr. Pam Lightsey say, at a conference last a couple few weeks ago, Lord, I be trying, I be trying, I be trying. <laughs> she said, I be trying, I really be trying, I really be trying. But difficult people test us. Can I get a witness? They test us, they push us to the limit. And it's okay to admit that they test us. What Paul says though, is that he challenges Timothy and those of us who are leaders or servants of the Lord to be gently instruct those who oppose the truth with the hope that God will change their hearts and that they will learn the truth. Then they will come to their senses. Notice what Paul is saying. It ain't you type that in the chat. It ain't me. It ain't, it ain't me. Now, sometimes it might be me, but type in the chat. It ain't me. Paul says, Difficult people, when you are 
patient, when you gently instruct them, instruct them, hopefully they will come to their senses and escape the devil's trap. He's suggesting that there are times, I'm not saying that everybody is difficult, is held in a trap by the devil. But what Paul is suggesting is that when these people, when you encounter difficult people, recognize that they just might be entrapped by the devil's snare and held captive by him to do whatever he wants. But our assignment, Paul says, is to do what? Be kind to everybody. Try not to quarrel. Be apt to teach and to try to be patient with difficult people. Somebody type, Lord, help me. <laughs> Look, because that, that difficult people right there, that's enough right there. Quarreling is a challenge. Teaching can be a challenge, but being patient with difficult people, think about the difficult folk on, folk on your job. I know when you heard that, you like, Lord Jesus, help me, please. Lord, help me. Please, Jesus. Please, Black Jesus, help me. <laughs> no matter what the scenario, we can divide. You can go to the next slide, Sean. Offended people into two major categories. Those who have been treated unjustly or those who believe they've been treated unjustly. I'll say that again. Most of the time, Offended people fall in two categories, two major categories. Those who have been treated unjustly or those who believe they have been treated unjustly. So this is why I mentioned a little earlier that sometimes when we get offended, it is because we have been treated unjustly. It is a natural response to harm, to injury, when someone is unkind to us. Offense is something that all of us feel. This is why Jesus said, it's impossible to live. <laughs> Dr. Angela Edwards said, Lord, help me, please. It's impossible to live in this world and not be offended. I would even add an addendum to that and say, it's impossible to live in this world and not be wounded, okay? So there are those who have been treated unjustly, but then there's a group that also believes, I'm sorry, that they have been treated unjustly. Look at this verse in Psalm 55, where David talks about what it feels like when somebody, someone has treated you unjustly. Psalm 55, 12 through 14. I hope you all are highlighting these scriptures so you can go back to them and you can meditate on them. He says, I could endure it if a foe were rising up against me. I could hide, but it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship at the house of God as we walked about among the worshipers. So David is suggesting that the offense that he feels, the wrong that he has suffered has not been at the hand of an enemy. Type that in the chat. Some wrong is not at the hand of my enemies. Some wrongs are done by the hands of those that I would least expect. He said, if it had been my foe, I could have I could have hidden from them. But it was you. We friends, we road dogs, we hang out together, we companions. We have enjoyed sweet fellowship at the house of God as we walked among the worshipers. This is one of the things that makes offense so difficult for some of us. I don't think that we have as much trouble with offense because we're going to be honest, type in the chat, we're going to be honest about offense because all of us get offended. That no need anybody saying that we don't get offended because we do. That's that's the way life is works. It's, it's, it's interwoven into the fabric of life. Uh, now, many of us may have worked at 
get into the place where we don't get offended as much. Somebody type that in the chat. I've worked to, to where I don't get offended as much possibly because God has been working with us and showing us how to handle situations where people do harm to us or injure us or hurt us. But at the end of the day, um, offense is something that all of us experience. It is impossible to leave, to live in this world and not get offended because what? There are people who deliberately, and sometimes it may be unintentionally, but it still hurts because pain is pain. Whether it's inflicted intentionally or unintentionally, pain is pain. Injury is injury. Hurt is hurt, right? But then there's another group. There's a group that is, I would say, legit offended. Legit, the offense is legit. That that what happened to us, what was done to us, was something that was done that hurt us, that harmed us, that bruised us, that wounded us. But then there's another category. Go to the next slide, Sean. Deacon Sean. The other group is the group that believe, and the operative word is what? Believe that they have been treated unjustly. Now, this is, the, this is where the trap often occurs sometimes because when we've been offended by somebody, when somebody has intentionally, deliberately offended us, we pretty much know it. But there are times when we just feel like or we believe that we have been unjustly uh, treated, treated unjustly. And this happens because we often be, believe that we have been wrong. Now, the operative word is believe. And remember, I talked to you all about this last week when I was saying how people can get offended about things and you don't even know they're offended. I tell you all a story. I remember <laughs> one year we were in the old building. And some of you probably remember this. A.R. Williams, Bishop A.R. Williams came and did a workshop for us called setting the house in order. And one of the last things he talked about that night was offense. And he talked about how the enemy uses offense in the pews to keep folk in the pews from listening to the pastor. Because if you get offended at the pastor, guess what? I can't minister to you. I can't talk to you. You don't receive anything I say because you've been offended because you feel that you've been treated unjustly. And he was saying, that until, he said one of the last things he wanted folks to do that night was get in line. And if anybody had been offended by the pastor, he wanted them to get in line and come up there and tell me. Well, when I tell you some of the things that people were offended by, I left there with my feelings hurt. Because some of the things that people said, and, and, and I'm saying this because in the second category, those who believe they have been treated unjustly. Some of the things that people said, I just couldn't even fathom <laughs> how they could have thought like that. But not only has that happened to me, that has probably happened to some of you. How many of you have had conversations with people that when they finally came around and decided to tell you what they were offended by, you were shocked? Do I have any witness? How many of you have, and you and you like you did what? I did what? And you weren't even thinking in that way. You there was nothing in your mind that was related to trying to offend anybody. So the other, the flip side of that that I will say is not only is it impossible not to be offended. But I would also say that because we interact with people and much of what we do is relational, whether, whether it's in ministry or whether it's on our job, not only is it impossible not to be offended, but it is impossible not for someone not to believe that we have treated them unjustly, even if we did not do it on purpose. So it's so both ways 
there's a challenge for us on both sides. We don't want to be offended, but we also don't want to offend anybody intentionally. We may offend people, but that may not be our intention. It could be an oversight. It could be just a matter of human error. Somebody type in the chat, folks are human. Give them a break. Give folk a break. Sometimes people are not deliberately overlooking us. Sometimes people are not deliberately trying to mistreat us. Sometimes people are not deliberately trying to hurt us. Sometimes it's just, it's just, the Bible says he knows our frame. Talking about God. He remembers that we are dust. So what does that mean? It means that there are times we need to just give folk the benefit of the doubt. Type that in the chat. Particularly for those of us that see everything through a lens of rejection and thinking that somebody is trying to hurt us or somebody is trying to do something to diminish us. Give folk the benefit of the doubt. And when all else fails, if you need clarity, just go and ask. You know, and you don't have to go in a in an accusing um, um, type of manner. You can ask what I call what 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 psychotherapists and people. I think Doc would would uh, vouch for me on this. They call them clarifying questions. Instead of going making a de a declarative um, accusation, get a, a clarifying question. So can I ask you something? It seems like so and so and so and so. Am I right about that? You know, then you disarm people when you ask the question. And what you end up finding out a lot of times is what we were thinking was just our imagination. Mm. Running away with me. Said it was just imagination. Come on. Running away with me. <laughs> Kyle Alanda said, okay, Pastor. Seriously, more often than not, it is usually just our imagination. And if we don't learn to ask clarifying questions, especially when it could potentially jeopardize the relationship, this is the other thing. Because when you get offended, particularly by someone that is a friend, someone that's close to you, the relationship is threatened. And so what we want to make sure we, thank you, Trace. Trace said, you better say, <laughs> I'm doing the best I can. So, so because the relationship is threatened, we want to make sure that we ask those clarifying questions as soon as we can. Because more often than not, what we when we believe we have been treated unjustly, it's not always true. I'm saying, um, I'm not saying that it's not true sometimes. Sometimes you are spot on. Sometimes we are exact. Sometimes we are 100% um, accurate. But then there are other times that what we believe is not necessarily what is what has actually happened. It is not necessarily the truth. It is not necessarily a matter of someone treating us unjustly. It do hurt us. But the problem with offense is that once we are offended, we nurture the offense. Type that in the chat. If we are offended bad enough, we nurture the offense. We nurse the offense. We carry it around like a purse on our shoulder or a, a, or a bag that we carry around. Somebody said we make movies. We create a story. And the enemy is so cunning and crafty. You know, we already mad. We already offended. Our feelings are already hurt. And if we're by ourselves and we're not having a conversation with anybody or getting clarity, we begin, the enemy begins to add to that. Yeah, they probably did do that. That's what they did. Because mm -hmm. you know, she did that the last time. And, and the time before that, before you know it, you are so angry. We are so angry. We are so, we have become so bitter. We have become so so resentful that we are we are in a trap of our own making or our own devising. 
we and then when we and then when we began to hold on to that offense, somebody said we see red. That's right. We began to justify how we feel. We justify the bitterness. We justify the unforgiveness. We justify the anger. We justify the envy and the resentment. And sometimes here's the other piece that makes relationships so challenging. Sometimes people are offended by somebody else, but we make those who remind us of the folk who have offended us pay the price. Come on, talk up in here, Holy Ghost. Can I say that again? I say sometimes the offense doesn't have anything to do with us. It has to do with somebody else in that person's life. Or if I'm feeling offended by somebody, it may not have anything to do with the person that I'm feeling that resentment toward. My resentment may be a result of somebody who, remind, they may remind me of somebody else that has offended me or who I believe has hurt me. So offense then, this is one of the reasons why it's a trap. And I hope I'm not making this too complicated. I'm, I'm trying to, I, it's so much I want to say. I'm sorry if, I, if I'm, if I'm, if I sound like I'm fumbling. Offense makes it easier then for us to blame people. Offense makes it easier for us to defend our position. Offense makes it easier for us to project the wrong on somebody else, come on, Holy Ghost, rather than doing a self-assessment, asking ourselves some questions, doing some self-interrogation, or possibly even talking to somebody that you trust and who is objective. Come by type. If I'm going to ask somebody about whether or not what I'm feeling is accurate. Ask somebody that's objective. Don't ask somebody that's going to co-sign with you on your feelings of resentment. Don't ask somebody that ain't spiritual. Okay. And I'm not trying to be hyper spiritual. Don't ask an immature person. Ask somebody who can be objective and who will tell you the truth. And then the other question that we have to ask is something that Dr. Frank Thomas asked us a couple of years ago when he did, he preached at our church anniversary. I don't know how many of you remember that sermon, but he preached a sermon and said, why are you offended? And I will tell you that this is a question that I've learned to ask myself uh, because I know how I'm wired, you know, and I know that I am a sensitive person. People might not think I'm sensitive, but I am a sensitive person, you know, and I can, my feelings do get hurt. I know people think pastors don't have feelings and that pastors feelings don't get hurt, but we do. We, we human just like everybody else. And what I, what pastoring has taught me as I've dealt with the saints, the saints, as I've dealt with the saints, pastoring has taught me and the Holy ghost has taught me to ask myself, Thank you, Rita. Don't ask a messy person either because they just going to stir the mess. Pastoring and the Holy Spirit have taught me to ask, why am I offended? Why am I offended? And then when you ask yourself the question, be willing to tell yourself the truth. Type that in the chat. Be willing to tell yourself the truth. Don't lie to yourself. Tell yourself the truth. Sometimes I've had to tell myself, I'm offended because this insulted my pride. Sometimes I'm not offended because it's my pride. I'm offended because it hurt my feelings. Sometimes I'm offended because it was just a plain old injury. It was an injury. It was someone who did harm to me. It may vary, but a good way to begin to, 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 to do some work some preventive work to, uh, to, so that we won't fall into the trap of a fit. That's right. Thank you, Dr. Angela. She said, open up an old womb. Like I used to say, my neck started burning all over again. I mean, you heard your grandmama or your mama say, I got mad all over again. <laughs> you get mad all over again. 
but it is a good exercise. That's the word I was trying to think of. To ask myself, type in the chat, ask, ask yourself before you get offended or when you feel yourself getting ready to get offended, why am I offended? That's what Dr. Dr. Thomas asked us in that sermon. We need to go back and listen to it, find it on, on, on live stream, on YouTube. Why? That's your homework assignment. Go back and look at that sermon. Why am I offended? Because if I, if I ask myself that question and I'm willing to be honest with myself, I cannot answer it without doing some self-interrogation. I cannot really answer that question without doing some self-examination. See, one of the things that offense will do, offense will always project on somebody else. It's going to always blame somebody else. It's going to always uh, make somebody else the villain. Sometimes they are. Type that in the chat. Sometimes they are. Sometimes the, somebody else is the villain. And, and oftentimes, People, there are times that people do things to deliberately hurt us. But there are also times that we are in, well, let me just put it this way. Sometimes we're in both of those categories. This is the way life works. Sometimes we're the villain and sometimes we're the victim. Victim. Sometimes we offend people. Come on, just type that in the chat. I'm capable of offending folk. So often when we think about offense, we only think about ourselves, but we never think about the fact that what we say to people, how we treat people, how we uh, disrespect people can offend them. We are just as capable of offending people as people are capable of, of offending us. So one of the good exercises to do when I start feeling offended, and it doesn't take much, because, you know, we live in a world where folks really have no sense of respectability and they don't mind offending you is to ask yourself, why am I offended? Why am I offended? Perhaps that's why you can go. Well, let me read this slide, because when we are offended, we often see ourselves as victims and blame those who have hurt us. Now, that's a whole nother lesson for another day. I wish I had time to talk about victim mentality because there are people that go through the world with a victim mentality. And Dr. Frank Thomas talks about this in his book, Spiritual Maturity. He talks about people that are legitimate victims. There are, there is a such thing as legitimate victims, people who are victims or victimized by the brokenness in society by the depravity, by the alienation, by the rebellion, by our own alienation toward God, which results in pain and brokenness and fragmentation for other people. But then there are also illegitimate victims. There, there are those of us that just always need somebody to blame. We need somebody to blame. We need somebody to, so, to take responsibility for things that we don't want to take responsibility for. Let me just give you a news flash and say, if you have victim thinking, if you're one of those with a victim mentality, more often than not, you're going to see yourself as the victim and blame everybody else. You will not be willing, and I'm not talking to anybody in particular. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. We will, I'll say we instead of you. We will not be, because even this is an example. This is one of the reasons why when I preach, I try real hard not to say you. I try to say we or us. Because you could be sitting in the pew and think I'm talking about you. I ain't talking about you. Not directly. I'm talking about what I'm talking about. <laughs> But if we if we have somebody said conviction, yes, sometimes it is conviction. But at the end of the day, if we have a victim mentality, and that's a question you need to ask yourself. Rita Maven said, always feeling sorry for ourselves, always looking for, always crying about something. One of the things that we also want to do in terms of self-examination and reflection is ask myself, do I I have a victim mentality. See, we don't do enough self-reflection. Type that in the chat. 
We don't do enough self-reflection. We, we project on other folk, but we don't reflect on our own lives. Woo, thank you, Holy Ghost. I like that. We, we project on other folk, but we don't reflect on our lives. And one of the things that's going to be necessary for our spiritual growth is that we must be willing to look somebody type at the man or the woman in the mirror. We have to be willing to look at ourselves and ask ourselves some of those questions, the kind of questions that somebody would ask us if we in therapy. And if we, if we just simply refuse to go to therapy, then you're going to have to be your own therapist or you're going to have to find somebody that will help you uh, navigate. We must be willing to ask ourselves some of those hard questions. Type that in the chat. I must be willing to ask myself some hard questions. Nobody but you and God. Why am I offended? Why did that make me mad? Why did I get so angry when they said, when they told me no? Why did I get so frustrated? Why did I blow off, the, go off the hair? Ask, we must be willing to ask ourselves some hard questions if we're going to get better at not being offended. We got to ask ourselves some of those why questions. Why does that bother me? Why does that make me mad? Why does that, why does that make me flip, flick? Because it ain't all them. Type that in the chat. It ain't all them. Ain't nobody typing. It ain't all them. It's not all them. Some of it is us. It's me. It's me. It's me, oh Lord. And, and let me tell you something. When you're dealing with people that have mastered having a victim mentality, come on, Holy Ghost. When you're dealing with people that don't want to take responsibility for their own action, they'll make you think you crazy. I'm just going to stop right here so y'all can shout. I said, <laughs> they will make you think, they will make you think you are crazy. When you are dealing with people that know how to gaslight, when you're dealing with people that know how to do emotional manipulation, when you're dealing with people that know how to blame and have a way with words, you will feel like something wrong with you. You'll be the one thing you need to go to get, to get therapy, and it's them. This is why I say all of us must take responsibility for asking ourselves some hard questions because oftentimes what we do when we don't ask ourselves the hard questions, we make life hard for other folk. Ooh, come on, Holy Ghost. I didn't intend to go that way, but I guess the Holy Ghost want me to say all this because we must be willing to ask ourselves some of the, because none of us are perfect and all of us are wounded. All of us have, yes, uh, Kim Morgan said, a narcissist will make you feel like that. They sure will. All of us have, right, because there are some people, and we don't even realize this, and this is why you got to read other material. Sometimes you're dealing with somebody with a personality disorder and you don't even know it. That's a whole nother conversation for a whole nother day. And you're around here trying to be a Christian to somebody with a personality disorder that refuses to get some help. Come on, help me, Holy Ghost. I ain't going to stay right there, but I'm just saying what I'm saying. So the first responsibility is to ourselves. It's to us. We must be willing to ask ourselves the hard questions. Because the best transformation that takes place is the transformation that God works in us. Okay, let me move on. This is why I go on to the next slide, Sean, because I just got all off for a few minutes. This is probably why Jesus said, whoa, somebody type whoa. <laughs> Y'all killing me in this chat running. <laughs> this is probably why Jesus said, whoa. Woe is another word for what great sorrow and distress unto the world because of offenses. That offense is what brings a lot of woe, sorrow, and distress. For it must needs be, this is King Jimmy talking, that offenses come, but woe to the man 
or the woman by whom the offense cometh. So what is what is Jesus saying? Jesus is basically saying that we want to avoid at all times offending other people. People may offend us because because that's that's just the word that it's a part of the fabric of life. But what we want to avoid at all costs is being the kind of person that brings offense on other people. Now, as I said before, there are going to be times that we will offend people unintentionally. It will not be our intention. It will not be something we intended to do. But even if we don't do it intentionally, when God calls it to our attention, we need to go back and clean it up. I remember I was at a um, I was at Reverend Elaine's uh, conference last year, and I was in between classes, and I had gone up to the vendors, and I was buying I had bought some clothes, and the clothes I was taking back the things I didn't like. So when I walked up there, she was already talking to another woman about some stuff. And when I, about some clothes or some things that she was getting ready to purchase. And so when I walked up, she spoke to me. And when she spoke to me, I just immediately just started talking. And I said, listen, uh, these clothes, they don't fit, blah, 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 blah. You know, I went to talking to her about exchanging my stuff. And the other woman just standing there. I'm just talking like she made a glass. Some people da, 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 are made of plastic. Da, da, da. You know, some people, y'all remember the song, I made a wood. <laughs> okay, let me stop. Okay. But anyway, I walked up like, like the woman was invisible. That's right, Motown. You know, I'm a Motown child, Motown sound. And finished my transaction, held a whole conversation with the woman. It wasn't until I got back in my room that night and I had to preach that night that the Holy Ghost said to me, you walked in front of that woman as if she wasn't even having a conversation. You need to apologize. And the Holy Ghost had, had dealt with me so about it that I ended up writing it into my introduction of my sermon because I was preaching this sermon about breaking line and skipping. Uh, and, and I wrote it into my sermon, but I went and found that woman in the worship center. And I apologized to her before that service started. And I told her, I said, I am so sorry. I said, I walked right up while you were talking and acted like you were not there. Well, when I tell you, that woman was telling everybody at that conference what I did. It meant so much to her. And she told some folk later, well, I'm glad. She told some folk later when she told her husband that I apologized. He told her, I'm glad you on your best behavior. Because evidently, she could be one that could clown. But let me just say, let me just tell you the truth. Let me kind of tell you the truth. I had to grow to the point where I would be willing to say something like that. And I'm not saying I've always been the type of person that tried to justify what I, what I, what I, when I've offended someone, but it takes, again, here's that word that we don't like, humility. It takes humility to admit that we're wrong. And I'm not saying this brag, and I'm simply saying we must be willing to humble ourselves. We have to be willing to humble ourselves to take responsibility and admit, and admit that something we did was wrong. You know why? Because pride will make us justify it. Pride will make us justify. And we will have a way of justifying stuff even when it's wrong. So what I'm saying to us tonight is we don't want to be offended, but Lord knows we don't want to be the kind of people that offend other folk. And I know a lot of times folk do things, we do it unconsciously because that was an unconscious act on my part. I would have never just walked up there and uh, barged in, pushed her out of the way. But even in unconscious acts, we still have the capacity to offend other people. This is why we need the Holy Ghost. This is why we, and when the Holy Ghost tells us to do something, we need to quickly obey. We need to do it as quickly as possible. And, and you know, at the end of the day, I wasn't embarrassed because I apologized to her. It really impressed her that, as she said, someone of my caliber would apologize to her. So she thought more of me after I apologized and God gets the glory. I'm not bragging. I'm just sharing this story with y'all. She thought more of me after I apologized than she did before. 
because I was willing to take responsibility for offending her, even though I did not offend her intentionally. Jesus said, woe to the person to whom the offense comes. So not only do we want people not to offend us, but we don't want to be offending other people. And, you know, we good at getting offended, but we, but we don't think all the time about how we, thank you, uh, Pastor Dunnigan. Pastor Dunnigan said, it released me and elevated me. And that's what happens when you do the will of God. That's really what happens when you do those hard things, particularly those things that our nature does not want us to do. It releases us and elevates us. God elevates us. In, in, in the spirit realm, and I'm not trying to be overly spiritual, but there's a transaction that takes place in the spirit, behind the scenes, that pleases God and honors God. And here's what I do know. When you honor God, God will honor you. Hallelujah to Jesus. In the 24th chapter, go to the next, next verse of Matthew. Jesus lets us know this about offense, that the end of the age will be characterized not by just a few people being offended, but many. Look at what Matthew 24, 10 through 13 says. And then Jesus in this particular passage, Jesus is talking about the end of the age. And what Jesus is saying is many will be offended at the end of the age. They will betray one another. They will hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. We are living in a time of where offense, disrespect, betrayal, hatred, and false prophets is on steroids and deception. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Not love in the sense of romantic love, but our inability to have unconditional agape, benevolent, uh, the kind of love that wants to see others do well, that thinks goodwill toward others, that that kind of love shall wax cold. But notice what Jesus says. He says, but the one that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. In other words, what Jesus is saying, these end of the age times are going to be characterized by great intensity, offense, betrayal, hatred, false prophecy, deception and sin, rebellion and alienation and love is going to wax cold. But those of us who endure, those of us who will stand firm, come on here, Holy Ghost. Those of us who will continue to try to be, the, be God's good creation, doing God's good work in the world. Those of us who will endure to the end. We're not talking about salvation in the sense of being saved from baptism as we, they shall be rescued. We shall be vindicated. This is the good news of the end time that we will come out as winners as the Bible has already declared in the book of Revelation. This is why, because it, we are in a time where people will be offended. Many, the Bible says, will be offended. I mean, the school teachers on this call could probably write a book about the parents that come attacking them every day about their little darlings. Even though their little darlings are cutting up at school, they want to believe that you're trying to mistreat their children. They want to believe that you are trying to um, uh, malign them and marginalize. I bet you, if we just, if we just pass the mic to the teachers alone, they could tell you, they could tell you some horror stories about how they get cussed out on general principle, general principle because of this spirit of offense. Because many shall be offended. I mean, you can say, you can, you can, <laughs> the things that people could say to us, that teachers could say to us, as <laughs> Keisha McKinnon said, happens daily. The things that teachers could say to us in, as, as general principle, out of concern as black. Uh, African-American instructors who are genuinely concerned about you. You know, we were growing up, everybody, every adult had the right to correct you. Every adult technically was your parent. 
When we were growing up, if you got in trouble at school, about a, that's right, the village. That's why we call out a uh, children's area, the village. You got whooped on your way home. The folk that lived on your street, come on here, somebody. I know I'm not the only one on here 60 or 50 or something years old. The folk on your street got you. I heard you was cutting up at school day because they had permission. And they we were still in an age of respectability. Same thing in healthcare. I could talk to the folk that work in the hospitals, doing the best they can, working with a shoe with a shoestring staff, tired, doing the work of a CNA, and they are registered nurse or a nurse manager, and they're getting cussed out for breakfast, lunch, and day. I mean, we could just go across the spectrum when we talk about how people, how we are in a time of offense, where people are easily offended. This is the kind of time that we're living in. Jesus says, but woe, great sorrow and distress to the one who offends others. So while I cannot avoid being offended by others, I can work very diligently to ensure that I don't offend other people. So it's a two-way street. I don't get off this, I don't get off the hook by just saying, talking about who offends me. What God calls me to do is think about the ways that I offend others. What do I do that rubs people the wrong way? What do I do that hurts or causes injury to other people? Either way it goes, we can. Somebody said, don't go out there and act like you ain't got no home train. That's what my grandparents used to tell folks. When you go out here, don't forget who you belong to. Don't forget your last name. Don't forget who your family is. You know, home training is non-existent anymore, which is one of the reasons why we have a generation that doesn't want to respect anybody and thinks that they can say anything to anybody. And nobody, so this is why folks are fighting and shooting each other over shoes and over crazy stuff. That man, I still don't know why the man was shot downtown on Beale Street the other night. I, I, we, I couldn't make any sense out of it. I mean, it, it, and then we live in a red state where they let people carry guns. It was over a spill drink, Lord have mercy. Over a spill drink, offense, offense. Offense is a deadly trap. And it not only can lead to, um, it can threaten the health of relationships, but it can take somebody, somebody's dead tonight over a spill drink. Somebody type in the chat, Lord have mercy. A spill drink. It will, uh, thank you, Alicia. It is not only deadly, not only will it kill people, but it'll kill our souls as well. And so this verse, this verse, Matthew 24 and Matthew, I think that was Matthew 18 that I showed, showed you all. It, it highlights the importance. And this is, this is the, this is the statement that I want you to go home on. Cause I, it's 734. This verse highlights the importance of avoiding causing offense and avoiding being easily offended ourselves. So somebody type in the chat, I got work to do. I got work to do because not only do I need, should I should I try to make sure that I don't fly off the handle as my grandmama used to say about every little thing. Now, some things are justified. Some things we have a right to be angry about. We have a right to be hurt about. We have a right to feel hostility about, but we don't want to be the kind of people that every little thing that we come in contact with or every little thing that is done to us. We are, we don't want to be like those parents that's going over to the school, cussing out teachers every day. Call it. Their little darling got in trouble or their little darling did something they didn't have to do. Cause you know, and they don't think you're supposed to say anything to them. Cause you know, we, we got a whole group of parents now that will tell their children, if they got something to say to you, tell them to tell me. Well, there are times that you do need to talk to the adult. But if you in my classroom, come on here, then I should be able to have stewardship over my classroom. So somebody type in the chat, I got work to do. We got work to do. We got work to do because Jesus said it's impossible 
to live in this world and not be offended. But woe to the one by whom offenses come. I'll say this and then I, and, and, and then I'm going to stop for real. Offense, the spirit of offense can divide and disrupt communities. It can disrupt relationships. And it often stems from a lack of humility, forgiveness, and love. I'll say that again. It can disrupt and divide communities, relationships, and it often stems from a lack of humility, forgiveness, and love. And the final thing I'll say is it's a deadly trap. It is a trap that we don't want to get ensnared in because it will hold us captive if we are not willing to do some of the hard work and ask ourselves some of those questions that I suggested that we ask ourselves tonight. One of the things that helped me um, is CPE. Well, it wasn't really CPE, but it was like CPE. In seminary, most of the time, when you are going to get an MDiv, you have to go through what they call CPE training or clinical pastoral education or um, a, a pastoral care practicum. And Bishop William Young was my pastoral care practicum supervisor, and he did not. All of you winning because you, if you're not willing to help yourself first, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right. Excuse I'm going to stop because it's 730 Pastor, to 38. Huh? Pastor, can yeah. you repeat what you were saying? You froze on my end. I'm not sure if you froze for some Okay. Moment. I see what Kathy said. She could no longer hear. What did you all miss? We heard you say CPE, clinical pastoral care education, and how Pastor Young was your... Okay, I'll repeat that. Okay. I was saying that one of the things that helped me with doing some of that self-interrogation and asking myself some of those questions, and those of you that have to get off, I understand if you have to get off because I, I definitely want to keep my word, you know, about holding you for an hour. Um, one of the things that helped me to do that kind of self-examination and ask those kinds of questions was going through past my pastoral uh, care practicum with Bishop William Young. And one of the things that he did with us, he did not play with us. You know, he made us ask ourselves the hard questions and <laughs> he would not let us go until we cry. He had all of us crying in that class. He knew how to break us down to a fraction to where we were able to address our own stuff. And what he said to us was, I know most of you have gone in the ministry or all of you have gone in the ministry because you want to help somebody. He said, but you cannot help anybody until you help yourself first. And that's what I would say to us tonight as we're talking about offense and we're talking about how offense affects us, affects our relationships, we cannot help anybody else until we are ready to do our own self-interrogation and ask ourselves some of those questions that I mentioned tonight. Why does this, why does this piss me off? Excuse me for saying that, but that's really what we say. Excuse me for saying it on Bible study. But why does this tick me off? Why does why does this it slipped out? Why does this? But, but that's what we be thinking. Why does this make me mad? Why am I so angry about this? Why do I feel so disrespected? Why am I mad? And we have to be willing to tell ourselves the truth because what, because what we will do is we will make excuses. Well, 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 well. No, 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 sugar. This, this is my session. Like I say, if you're not going to get your own therapist, if you're not going to get a therapist, be your own therapist. 
and ask you, because we all need therapy. We all do. I don't care who we are. Pastors, preachers, deacons, leaders, ministers, we all could use a therapist. EAP on our job. Come on, talk to me somebody. We could all use a therapist or somebody who is objective enough, spiritual enough, mature enough to tell us the truth. Because we wrecking folks' lives and we leaving dead bodies behind us in some instances. Folks have wrecked us, but we can, we are also, we are also capable of wrecking other folks' lives. And we don't want to do that. We want to be people who represent Jesus. That's right. Thank God for Dr. Carter. Let me give my commercial again. This is one of the reasons why we have this emotionally healthy spirituality class on Sunday mornings. Because as Sean probably learned when she was doing her doctoral work, emotional intelligence, the area of the soul, is probably the area where we have the lowest EQ. We can have a high EQ and a low EQ. And what many people don't realize is that what's keeping us from moving up on our jobs and in other places is not our IQ, it's our EQ. Our emotional quotient. Because we don't know how to manage relation. First of all, we can't manage ourselves and then we don't know how to manage relationships with others. I'm going to stop because if I start, I keep on talking. So I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to poo quiet. I'm going to poo quiet. Is uh, Ian used to say, my God, so he used to say, he's going, you poo quiet, Maria. I'm going to poo quiet. I'm going to poo quiet. Somebody said EQ can take us where... IQ can take us where EQ can't keep us. That's right. And, and let me just say this to you, since I'm here. IQ, they say, can't be changed, but EQ can. Emotional quotients can be changed with feedback. Hallelujah. That's why we all need somebody in our lives that can tell us the truth. Somebody in our lives that ain't impressed with us. And who we have given permission to tell us the truth. Because we have to give people permission to do that. Because everybody doesn't have the uh, permission to speak in our lives. And, the, and that that makes sense. Because you don't have the relationship. You, you, you know, you can't be going up to folks saying stuff to them if you don't have a relationship with them. That offends people. But if you have a relationship with them and you are mature enough to hold them accountable, one of the things that makes us, keeps us from growing is that we got enablers in our life. We have people in our life that don't challenge us when we are wrong, that don't challenge us when we are doing things that are dishonor God or those things that are offensive to other people. We have enablers. We don't have people that hold us accountable. So if we, if we don't have people that will hold us accountable, if there are people that we won't listen to when they try to talk, to, then we got to be our own, and we won't go to counseling, then we need to be our own therapist and start asking ourselves some of these questions so that the woe that Jesus is talking about doesn't apply to us. Let me stop. Any questions? Any comments? Questions? Comments? Can y'all oh, yeah. tell I have a good time on Bible study? Who was that? I did okay. oh, Stuart, I have a question. Okay. Can you repeat those? Can you repeat those scriptures for me? Um, so I can have them. They you was kind of going a little fast. Hey, Pastor Stuart. Which ones are you? Hey, who is that? Is that my girl? <laughs> That's no, she just got is that my girl school. talking to me. Yes, oh, okay. ma'am. Um uh it was Matthew 28, I mean 24. The last one that we just looked at. Is that what you're talking about, Sana? Uh, yes, and the one before that that you said we need to meditate on. Matthew 18 and 7 and Matthew okay. 24. Yeah, and then the other thing I said, too, was to go back and find Dr. Frank Thomas's sermon. It should be on our YouTube page 
I'll ask Sean to check with Stacy. Stacy's still recovering from surgery, but I'll ask Deacon Sean to check with Pastor Stacy. I'm pretty sure it's out there. It should be. He preached a sermon a couple of years ago called Why Are You Offended? Okay. And then the other thing I gave you as a homework assignment was to begin to ask yourself some of those clarifying questions. You know, normally learn to ask, well, not just ask yourself clarifying questions, but if you the if there is a situation or a case where you think that you've been offended by somebody, somebody has offended you, before we before we jump off the handle and refuse to give people the benefit of the doubt, it may be a good idea to just ask a clarifying question. Let me ask you something. Did, did, I thought I heard you say, and this is just an example. I thought I heard you say so-and-so and so-and-so. Is that what I heard you say? Then, then what, what happens when you do that, you don't put people on the defensive. You give them a chance to explain themselves. And then, and then if they said, well, that's not what, that's not what you heard. Well, that's, well, that's what I thought I heard. And then, you know, it leads to a whole different type of conversation. And then possibly a relationship is saved rather than severed. So you got that, Sanaa? Yes, ma'am. I'm writing it down now. Okay. Anybody else come in question before we hang hey, up? Hey, Pastor, I, I have a question. I, I'm okay. sorry. I wrote several down, but I'm just going to ask you one. Uh, one of them is, well, this question is, it's a twofold question. If if you are being corrected, okay, uh -huh. and you receive that correction, and your feelings get hurt, right? right. Um, and then you may, right? right? So you go from your feelings being hurt, right. then you go to being upset. Right. Now you got all of these emotions that you're dealing with. But the person that corrected you was correcting you because they love you. Right. It still don't change the fact that you offended <laughs> by right. and my your mom used to call it corrective criticism, right? That's what my right. used to call it. But it still didn't change uh -huh. the fact that it right. made me mad because I didn't necessarily ask for your opinion about. <laughs> what it was that I was doing or how you felt about it. That's that's the first part, and, and I'll let you get. Then in leadership, I offend people, I hate to say this, on a, almost a daily basis because I have to do corrective actions with my staff because they're not doing what they should be doing, and then they're offended. Um, right. So how do you balance all of it? Well, without, first thing, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say without being just so matter of fact about correcting people. Yeah. Well, first of all, I don't know that correction is ever, ever feels good. In all the times that I've had to be corrected, whether it was on a job or whether it was, you know, my parents correcting me about something, I never feel good about it. You know, sometimes I remember one time I got a C in writing in the third grade. And here I am, 64 years old. And I still remember that that morning that my dad had dropped me off at my grandmother's house. He waited because he didn't like the fuss, right? And he waited until he got, we got, I was getting ready to get out of the car. And he says to me, now, Gina, you do not need to bring home another C for writing. I cried all day because my dad <laughs> And he didn't even raise his voice. But then he knew my feelings was hurt. And what healed me, he came back and told me, he said, you see my penmanship? He said, look at that. He said, I got on you because I don't want you to write like me. Well, that healed my entire soul. Because what he did, he didn't just correct me, but he helped me to understand why he was correcting me. Now, everybody's not going to do that. So what I would say is, when well, you got to trust the heart of the person that is correcting you. I think you all have heard me say more than one time, Shirley Prince would call me and take me to lunch and set me out. And I'd be mad at her for two weeks. But I got over it. You know, I think you, you, you're you going to be hurt, but you also have to realize that when someone corrects you, 
you want to believe that it comes from a good place. And that when somebody is correcting you that it, it comes from a good place, they're not going to say anything to you that is going to deliberately hurt you. But you got to believe that about that person. And you got to be you 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 have to feel that this person has your best interest at heart. That doesn't mean it's not gonna hurt and it's not gonna sting and it's not gonna burn, you know. But at the at the same time, you got to believe that they care about you enough because, as I said before, you have to care to confront. You have to care to correct. It's it's very easy to just let people go around with their slip hanging. And they slip sticking in their panties and not say a word. Excuse the euphemia, euph the, uh, the the illustration. I mean, ain't nothing worse than a woman walking around with her slip stuck in her panties and she don't know it. That's the way people let us do a lot of times. They let us walk around embarrassed and they don't say anything because sometimes we cannot handle the correction or the feedback. And what happens is people get tired of that. And so they say, okay, well, if you're not going to receive it, then I'm going to stop talking. But you can't work for me. Because if I can't correct you, you can't work for me. If I can't challenge you, you can't work for me. Because the other thing that correction and challenging does, as, as much as it stings, it helps us to grow. Type in the chat, it hurts to get better. I don't care what it is, whether you exercising, whether you trying to lose weight, or whatever, Stan, that's right, Stan, I say that all the time. Behavior ignored is behavior condoned. So we have to believe that it's coming from a good place, but love sometimes demands correction. And I would also say that we get over it. You know, I, like I said, I would get mad at Shirley Prince. I'd be mad for two weeks. But a couple of weeks later, she called me, Rhoda, let's go to lunch. I'd be right there. <laughs> Because that's where forgiveness comes in. That's where I choose not to be offended, where I decide that this is for my good and that even though it stings and even though this is this correction hurts, she is not she is not talking about me. She is correcting my behavior. I think that's the other thing. We have to separate the person from the behavior. Most of the time people are addressing behavior. They're addressing our actions. They're addressing how we are acting. But they're not necessarily diminishing who we are, but they are addressing our actions. And as a leader, you have to be strong enough to correct people. Because if you don't correct them, guess what? It will kill your organization. It will damage morale. It will cause people to uh, lose respect for you. When you stand by as a leader and watch people do things that everybody else know is wrong and don't say anything. So you have to have, and I'll never forget this word that uh, Joanne Nicholson said once, you have to have managerial courage. And as I say so often, you got to care more about being respected than you care about being liked. Because if all you want is to be liked, you're not going to hold people accountable. And the truth is, <laughs> they might not like you anyway. <laughs> most folk, most employees, <laughs> there are exceptions, but you know, they're not the president of the boss's fan club. Come on now. There are exceptions, like I, my employees love me, okay? That's the good thing about working in the church. Hallelujah. But I know that there have been some times I made them mad because, baby, I can go up one side and down the other. And don't think because I don't do it publicly that I don't do it. Because there are some things, I have some ethical commitments that I live by as a leader and as a pastor. And there are just some things that are non-negotiable to me. And if I see it, I'm gonna address it. And that is the price of leadership. 
Now, there are, there are some of us, you know, we have ways of correcting people, you know, and we all have different temperaments. But at the end of the day, you cannot correct a person and then act like it's not important. You know, there has to be some level of, of being firm when you're correcting folk. Because as, as folks say about that, you're an ancient buddy. And see, well, we want to be in leadership time sometimes. We want to be buddies and we want to be leaders. You can't be both. Renita Wings put a picture on Facebook the other week with a woman with a fly swat <laughs> turning around in a pew. I ain't your friend. I'm your friend, but I ain't your friend. You understand what I'm saying? Because there is a certain distance that you must maintain as a leader so that you can correct folk. Because if you play too much, folks not going to take you seriously. That's a whole nother leadership. That's a whole nother lecture. I hope I helped you, Tracy. Oh, yeah, you did. You did. Okay. I mean, it's just, and you I'm know, gonna tell like you, I said, take, offending, offending people, yeah, offending people every day. And they'll tell me, Miss Trace, I'm real offended. You know, I come to work and work hard. At and there's Trace some strategies that you can do. There's some strategies that you can do. You know, you don't have to go in and chew folk out. You can start out by complimenting them first. You know, right. I want to thank you for what you're doing. You're doing a great it's job, blah, 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 blah. But here's an area that I believe is an opportunity for growth. I mean, there are tools that are available that can help you. Alicia could probably give us a workshop on stuff like that because that's what she does. And one day we might get her to do something like that because there are those of us here who are in leadership that could use that kind of skill set. But it, it goes without saying, Alicia said, make coaching a sandwich, right? It goes without saying that if you are a leader, correction is something that you have to do. And if you're scared to do it or you don't want to do it, you know, then you will have some problems. And not only are you going to have problems, the person that empowers you is going to have problems because they empowered you so you could do some of the things that they wouldn't, wouldn't ha won't have to do. So if they got to do it all, then what they got you for? Right. <laughs> anyway, it's, going, it's getting late in the evening and the sun is going down. Y'all still sitting up here on this call. <laughs> Pastor Stewart, can I share yeah. what I meant by uh make coaching a sandwich? Please, Alicia. Um, you you start by sharing something good or something that went well. Uh that's the that's the first piece of bread. And the main content is you communicate the opportunity. You know, one thing I I, I will never forget. <laughs> Doc, Dr. Um Doc said when we were in um, Stephen ministry training was that you want to level with people and not level I'll them level. in the process. Mm -hmm. I, I never forgot that. So if you start with something good um, and then, you know, share the opportunity, you know, you, you, you've been late for the last, you know, in the last month, maybe you've been late four times. Don't so is something going on? Right. Is it something that you need? Are you having any challenges with transportation? A lot of times people are having problems, but they don't want to say anything because they think it makes them a bad employee, you know. Right. But but once you um, share the, the challenge, then you um, let them know what the expectation is and let them know they can come talk to you anytime and ask them, uh, can I get your commitment to support what we've discussed today? Mm -hmm. And then close it with something good. Uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, I received two compliments about how you have served our customers, and I'm gonna make sure you get recognized in front of your peers. Mm -hmm. So that won't allow them to walk away completely wounded. They'll think about it, and they and they'll know they have something to complete. But the whole purpose of, um, you know, performance correction is to help the employee correct the behavior for them to be better. And, and it right. helps to explain that as well. Mm -hmm. Because some people think you just out to get me, but right. I need you. I need you to help 
uh, us be successful at this work, I'm not out to get anybody. I'm right. out for us to be the best that we can be. You know, you know, I I put on makeup and dress up to come in here to win, not to lose. So, right. That's what I was about to say, because we all win. Yeah. We all win. Yeah. But Dr. Carter said that when we were in Stephen Ministry training years ago, and I'll never forget it, you want to level with people and not level them in the process. So that right. requires you to have individual consideration. And the only way you can do that is you get to know the people. Right. Yeah. But that's not And right. talk to them more than when you just correcting them. Right. Right. You know, because if you take some time to care about people's lives, there are cer certain things you can find out before it even gets to that. Any other questions? All right. I put in the chat, give them a sandwich. <laughs> That's what Alicia just gave us. Give them a sandwich and level with people without leveling them. Well, we have gotten a little bit of everything tonight. We got emotional intelligence. We got leadership development. We got scripture. <laughs> we got information about offense. We're going to be dangerous when we go to work tomorrow. <laughs> That's why it's called life application. That's right. That's right. Because we do want to apply this word to our lives. And we want to represent Jesus. But we also recognize that we are a work in progress ourselves. And praise God for all the gifts in the body that help us all to be better. All right, let's pray. I'll, I'll just pray the closing prayer. God, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you for the power of your word. We thank you for the, the transformational power of your word, how it changes us how it convicts us and corrects us, but it also makes us better. I thank you for every person on this call, every person on this line, for those who are even still on this call long after the, the class has really ended, but just hanging around for the residue and for the drops, oh God, and for those nuggets, those organic moments that no one can orchestrate, but they just are, they, they happen organically in conversation and in community. Thank you for every person in this, in these boxes for their desire to be in study and to grow, to become the people that you have already predestined us to be from the foundation of the world. And God, we thank you tonight that you, you are going to finish the work that you began in us that even as we are studying and then we're learning about offense and doing our own self-examination and asking those inter self-interrogating kinds of questions that, at, that force us to look inward and ask ourselves some of the hard things that we have to ask. We thank you that you knew who we were from the foundation of the world and you loved and you didn't love us any less. So we say thank you for loving us. Thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for how you continue to give us chance after chance after chance after chance after chance. And as we have received mercy, we ask that you would help us to also go and extend your mercy. Re redeem the time tonight for everyone that has been on this call and bless the work of their hands. Yes, Lord, establish the work of their hands. We pray for those who are sick, those who are going through bereavement, those who are traveling to, to various places, those who will go into hostile workplaces. We lift up Tracy tonight, oh God, in her role as a supervisor. And we ask that you would give her grace for her assignment and strength and power to match the task. We, we pray for those who may be going for surgery, wherever we are going tomorrow whatever we have to do tomorrow, whatever we're going to face tomorrow, we ask that you would be with us, that you would sustain us and that you would keep us and that you would bless us. And Lord, we ask that you bless our church. We pray even now, God, 
that you would continue to strengthen CNBC, that we might be an extension of your body and that we might continue to transform lives, transform individuals, transform communities and transform your world to your glory, to your honor and to your praise. This we pray in the name of Jesus and all those that agree with this prayer say it together.